Hello everyone! Welcome to the Science Center Observatory Facebook page again. I'm Yating and together with me, co-hosting the show is Barry. Hi everyone, it's me again. <laughs> yes, this is the both of us again. I'm sure by now you should know we are both science educators from the Science Center Singapore. Now for our followers who have been watching this page, you are probably waiting excitedly in front of your computer right now. Um, because we are waiting for our special guest to appear. But before we introduce her into the show, <laughs> we must take this opportunity to thank the US Embassy Singapore for coordinating and inviting our special guest today. So this broadcast is made possible only because of US Embassy Singapore. Thank you so much. So uh, without further ado, Perry, shall we introduce our guest into the show? Of course, yeah, Ting. Our special guest today is a chemist. He's a retired United States Air Force colonel, a former NASA astronaut with more than 180 days in space, accumulated during two space shuttle missions and a six-month expedition to the International Space Station. She acted as the lead robotics and lead science officer during her tenure aboard the ISS, performing the second ever robotic capture of a supply ship from the station. Let's welcome Dr. Katie Coleman. Hello, Hi, I'm so happy to be with you. Yachin and Ferry, I, I love that you bring science to everyone and you love to explain it. And it's been nice even in the times we've gotten to talk. I'm very excited about talking today. We are excited to have you in our show. We are so nervous. <laughs> but we're going to make this show a blast today, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's very right. funny. You know, no one's ever said that before, Yachin. That's very good. <laughs> I like yeah, that. Yeah. And I love your uniform. Yachin, you've been to space camp, yeah? Uh, that's right. Myself and Ferry, we have both been to the space camp in Alabama. Yep. Yeah, you know, we're so right. proud of it. Nice. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's, they, they learn a lot there. And I made them send me all the books because I wanted to make sure I knew everything that the people at space camp knew. Oh. <laughs> But also we've had our, now we've had astronauts who have been to space camp and become astronauts. So you're off to a very good start. Yay. Wow. Okay. So uh, anytime now, Ferry and I will see you there in space. <laughs> That's the dream. That's the dream. Yeah. All so right, Katie. Shall, shall I show some slides, Yachin? Oh, yes, that's right, um, because I, I'm very sure our uh, audience today are very keen to know about your journey to space. So, uh, Katie, can you show us some of your slides about your journey to space? I, I would love to, partly because I think going to space is so fantastic. It seems like something that maybe, you know, only special, special people do. And, and so I really like to share what we do there. And I think you will realize that space is closer than you think. And we all, you know, space is part of where we live. So I'd like to show it. Um, and so are the visuals up? Great. So this is in 1995, a long time ago, but uh, I was at NASA for a very long time being an astronaut. And my first mission, I had two missions on the space shuttle and then spent about six months on the International Space Station. And so the f I wanted to talk just a tiny bit about the space shuttle. I am inside this space shuttle right now and uh, look under the, in the tiny, tiny windows there. That is where I am sitting. And right now we are going about 100 miles an hour before we've even crossed the, the launch pad. It's so exciting. And it's amazing to go this fast in a vehicle. We were with seven people, five brand new astronauts on our way to doing experiments in space because we were figuring out how are we going to do experiments up on a space station. So that was our mission, was to understand how to do experiments. This is my second mission. I was very proud to be on the crew that launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory. It's a telescope that's like the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA has a family of telescopes. And they all look at different wavelengths of light. And Chandra is so exciting because Chandra looks at X-rays. And so, um, and that's, that's what X-rays are given off when things are being sucked into black holes. X-rays are being spewed out. When stars are exploding, that's called a supernova. That's when we're seeing X-rays. And we also, I was very proud to be part of this mission because Eileen Collins in the middle, she is the first woman to be in charge of the space shuttle. And I really liked having her be my boss. 
but more about the space station. This is up in space right now, and it's built. Um, we have, you know, 15 major partners, including countries all over Europe, um, Japan, Canada. Um, the United States, Russia, but we have so many countries and I think experiments from Singapore as well up on the space station um, because we are doing so many experiments that are done in international collaboration. So right now in space, we have actually right now three people in space. Um, and the way we have been, this is our space station, you can see it, but I like you to look at it uh, this way. On the way to the space station, that's where it's kind of small, and we go with a small crew. This is my crew of about three people. We have myself in the middle is Dmitry Kondratyev from Russia, and on my right there is, uh, is Paolo Nespoli from Italy. And this is, it's a very small space for us to be in. You can see it's very tiny, but this is what I wanted to show you. When you think about being in space and you think, oh, do I want to go? If you think about being so crowded like that, well, it might not seem appealing. But look at this space station. It's huge. It's giant. It takes up an entire football field, European football field even. And we we do our spacewalks out on the edges. But in the middle, that's where our, the modules are that we are living in. There's about 10 of them. Everyone is about the size of a, of, a met, of, a, of a train without the seats in it. So inside, it's really beautiful. Usually, we have a crew of six. We, we make that crew of six by having three people in space, three people join them, and then later on, three go home, three more come. So we're always changing partners up on the space station. And here, this video, it lasts about one and a half minutes. This is our crew going up to the space station, climbing into that rocket right there. We are inside the middle part there, not the very tiny part of the top, but just below. And we are inside there. Yep. And we're able to see, we're able to wave when we, when we have the cameras on there. But now you see us docking or parking at the space station. And this is where I lived. And I loved it so much because it's really about people living in space. And we're having more and more places that we can launch to the space station from the Earth. Just last week, we established a new vehicle to be able to bring people up to space and even more on the way. And it's, it's, it's human beings living in space, doing things that they love, and also having a relationship with the Earth. And now looking out the window, you can see why I felt so close to the Earth, where you, we are far away. We are about 400 kilometers away. And at the same time, it's actually very close. It's very, very close. It's, it takes about eight and a half minutes to get there. And when we look down at the Earth, we feel very connected. I felt very connected to the Earth and to the place that I come from. My ancestors come from Ireland. And so I love to, to end this film with a picture of Ireland. And, uh, and But I think it's always important to see some place that looks like home. Uh, Yachin and Ferry, do you recognize this place right here? Of course. Yes. <laughs> this is Singapore. Our you know, home. I, you know and, and that's what's really magical is to see the place that you call home. Because it's so Im, Im, it's important to realize that, you know, it's all about perspective. And for me, you know, I felt like the world was home. And so in some ways, I felt like Singapore was home. And I forgot to mention that I, I've actually been to Singapore several times and, um, and actually given a, a talk at your very beautiful and fascinating science museum, so I'm very happy to be back. Now, a couple more pictures about science, and then I would love to answer any questions that you have. Now, I say I'm going to talk about science, but then I show you these, you know, oranges and tomatoes and onions floating around, some lemons, too. I, it's because I wanted you to see that life is different up in space. Everything is floating around and including our food. Now, we do actually play with our food. It's very fun to live in space. In space. So... <laughs> And I mean, to me, that's one of my favorite slides. And I think for the kids out there, I'm just going to show it one more time, okay? Because I just really think it's very fun to think about, you know, what if your food floated everywhere? Well, that's actually what makes it possible for us to do our experiments. Now, here is my friend Jeff. He's looking at a drop of water. 
but it's making us fear. Well, and it's because when we are up in space without gravity, we, we do have a little gravity, but not very much. But without the big, big force of gravity, we can study the tiny force of surface tension, of what do liquids really want to do. And it's very important for everything to do with fluids down here on Earth. Now, the same principle really applies to, uh, for example, growing plants. You know, we'd like to understand how to grow plants in space. And to do that, we had to figure out how to grow them under very hard conditions. Well, here on Earth, we have some very hard conditions for growing things. And some of the things that we learn in space about how to grow plants turn out to be very useful down here on Earth. And in fact, a lot of the things we've learned are useful in vertical farming, which I think actually Singapore has a lot of uh, specialties in. And so uh, so this is me growing a plant. And uh, I'm not really not going to talk very much about the classic things of you know, wearing a spacesuit and doing spacewalks. I was very proud to be the smallest person uh, up on the space station to have their very own spacesuit up there. Um, but I, I think now it would be better to see what kinds of questions you have and go away from the slides and just see what we end up talking about. OK, well, I must say some of the views are really, really breathtaking. and. The ISS looks like a very, very fun place to be in. I mean, you get to hang out with all the other astronauts and doing all those cool stuff. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us, Katie. <laughs> You're welcome. I think it's really fun, too. Yeah. Okay, so we do have some questions from the Girls to Pioneers community, which we mm -hmm. will be um, asking you throughout the broadcast. So once again, we want to thank them for sharing the show with uh, their members of the United Women Singapore. So our first question Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Ishal. She is 10 years old. And her question is, how old were you and what made you decide to be an astronaut? Ishal, I was much older than you are um, when I decided to be an astronaut. And part of that reason is that there were not as many women astronauts. And I never saw any pictures of them. So when I saw people going to space, it was always men and people that didn't look like me. And it wasn't until Sally Ride, the first American woman astronaut, came and talked at my school when I was in college, so I was about 20 years old, that I thought, wow, she has a job where it's important to study hard in school and learn things and become something that you think is really important that you love. And yet she also has this job where she has a great adventure and she gets to be an explorer. So I am happy that you get to see more astronauts, but mostly I, I want to make sure that you realize that you can do anything that you like to do. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll do lots of exploring and, and uh, figuring out what you'd like to do. Yes. Well, thank you, Katie, because um, I personally have a young daughter myself. And I always tell her, you know, dream big because uh, we can be anyone we want to be. So that's really inspiring. Yep. So uh, we have another question from our IG follower. Uh, what was the selection process to become an astronaut and what was the hardest part during the training process to be an astronaut? I'm glad you asked about how to be selected as an astronaut because it's, it's an important answer not just for being an astronaut, but for actually wanting to pursue anything that you're interested in. When, when you're doing that, you probably need the help of others and you need to let them know why they should want to have you on their team. And that means filling out an application, whether it's on the computer or on paper or knocking on someone's door and saying, I like what you're doing and I'd like to help. And so in order to do that, you have to do something I think is very hard. You have to tell people what is very special about you. You have to tell people why, you know, and if you don't tell people, well, you know, I think I would be a good astronaut because I'm smart and I'm, I'm good at learning things, and I like to be on a team and help my other teammates. But it feels a little bit like bragging, which is kind of uncomfortable. But in order to tell people about yourself and be on their team, you have to do that. You have to do a little bit. Of, you have to tell them who you are. And it may feel like bragging, but it's really sharing. So that, that and, and, and I think in terms of the training, the answer is a little bit the same. You have to be brave enough to tell people who you are and, and what you can bring to the team. Wow. 
I guess to be an astronaut, you really, really have to have the right stuff, isn't that right, Katie? Well, I think the right, I think the right stuff comes in many forms, Ferry. Yeah. And you know, when you think about here on Earth, we have lots of people who do lots of different things, and all of them are good at solving different kinds of problems. Well, we need all of them in space too. Yep. Wow. I'm. I mean, I'm at a loss of words now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, why don't you tell us uh, more about your expedition? What do you do in space and maybe one of your most memorable experiment that you conduct in space? Um, so one of the things, well, first of all, one of the experiments that I love is actually me. I am an experiment. Wow. <laughs> all of the astronauts um, from all the different countries are volunteering for medical experiments because we go to space and the conditions are different. For example, down here on Earth, when your heart is having, your heart is having to pump blood from your feet, you know, down to your feet, up from your feet, up to your head, you know, and it's really working very hard. Well, think about us. We're in space. We're floating around. And it turns out that we, uh, we really, our hearts don't have to work as hard. And so they actually begin to be a smaller muscle up there. So, and that's some of the things that happen when people are older. So we get, we have a way of studying hearts that is different than on the ground. And so we, they study our hearts and find lots of details. It's useful lessons for space and for, uh, and for also for, um, uh, you know, for, for exploring. I wondered, I have actually a few, um, I have a little tiny movie of, of living in space. I wondered if you'd like to see that because I think it illustrates some of the things that we've been talking about. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yes. So this is my friend Satoshi Furukawa from Japan. And I just wanted to show you a little more about living in space. And we do a lot of exercising that has to do with those experiments that we talked about to stay healthy. And, and some things that we do, um, we don't actually have a shower which might make you think, oh, you know, we're not very clean, but we just take a sponge bath. This is our sleeping bag, and it can be tied to the wall like Mike's is, or I actually take mine off the wall, and I curl up like a little ball, and I sort of bounce around my cabin. Um, we all learn how to fix things, and I didn't really know how to do that when I was growing up, and I learned how to use tools and how to fix things. This is Mike looking out our window and looking down at the ocean with all the little clouds there. And now this is an interesting physics experiment. It looks like Mike and his crewmates are going backwards. They're going to the left. But think about if Sergey right there, look, what, think about if he's still, and it's actually the space station that's moving. And then this is one of the reasons I love to show you this movie. Satoshi loves baseball. And so everybody's busy with experiments. So Satoshi has to be the whole team. He had to be the pitcher. And now he's going to be the batter. <laughs> I love this. Wow. And now, oh, he has to be out in the field to catch his own ball. <laughs> <laughs> so we're inventing all sorts of new ways of being up in space. And look here, they're, they're sort of, you know, having a little fun here. But see how when they dive, they actually have to kind of work their way around. They have to, like, kind of pull themselves, pull themselves just a little bit when they do that. Because when you're in, in space, you're only going to go straight. So it's not like diving off a diving board where gravity brings you down. Here's a typical dinner up in the, um, in the Russian part of the space station. And sometimes we're sharing with the world. Um, I, I think I can take more questions or I can show you uh, some other things that we do in space. It's up to you. Oh, okay. So, uh, Katie, we do have uh, more questions coming from uh, Girls Great. to Pioneers uh, Girls. So, we have Stacy and Lucy. They are uh, 12 and 11 years old. Um, so, we just combine their question together. Uh, what does it feel like to live in microgravity environment? And was it comfortable to sleep in space? So my answer, uh, Stacey and DC, is that it was delicious to live in a microgravity environment. You know, down here on Earth, we have to walk or run or, you know, it's just like this. And up in space, it's like we're, we're weightless, so we're floating. But when we want to go somewhere, then we're flying. 
just like maybe the book Peter Pan when they're flying everywhere. And it's, it's, it's actually so easy. At first, when I was up there, I would have to kind of like pull myself like this or, or think I needed to look like Superman, you know, like this. But then I realized that all I had to do was do, you know, one little, one little push just with one finger and I would move across the whole space station. So it's really delightful to live up there. And the same goes for sleeping. I was saying during the movie, our sleeping bags are sort of like little, little, little cloth bags. Then we slither into them like a snake and you can attach it to the wall so that when you wake up, you know, you're right here. But I kind of like to sleep in a little ball. I would, I would pull my knees up like this and I would zip up the zipper. So now I'm like a little ball. And then I would bounce around my cabin. It's a small little room with my computer in it. And sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm looking at the bottom of my computer desk. So I'm upside down. It's just, it's so much fun. <laughs> Well, I'm just I'm just curious because you 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 might be upside down sometimes, right? Do you feel like all the blood is gushing to your to your head? You know, you don't. And actually, you know, sometimes in um in trying to uh um you know uh practice down here on the earth, it could be challenging. Like we practice our spacewalking in a giant swimming pool, and if we're gonna do something upside down in our spacewalking, then we actually have to uh. Um, we, we actually, you know, can't be upside down forever when we're practicing. So we have to learn how to how to simulate down here on the earth. Mm. Wow. Okay. wow. Okay. Are you ready to take the next question, Katie? Sure. Okay. What did you miss the most while you were living in space? I missed my family. Um, can I show you a picture of my family? Of <laughs> because I actually think it comes a little bit with an important lesson, really. So this is my son who's 10. I have another son who's older, who's um, at the time he was about uh, 27 or so. And my husband, Josh, who's an artist. And, you know, we're a team up in space. We come from several different countries. We're all very different people. And I find that the thing, you know, we behave differently. And sometimes, you know, it's like when you're working in a group in school, sometimes you wish your friends were like, oh, you're like, oh, I wish they would be different. Or, oh, this makes me mad. I mean, it happens to astronauts, too. And I find that the thing that sort of joins us together, something we all have in common is family. And uh, in the fact that, you know, when I left Earth, I left my son back on Earth, which, of course, made me incredibly sad. And I missed him and my husband and my stepson so very much. And that's actually the thing that as a crew, you know, we have in common. Here's my son and, and our cat who actually stays with him all the time. And our cat is a little confused. Our cat thinks that our, he's a dog. So that can be a little bit confusing for him. Now my son is older. He's going to college. There's my husband. I, I like to see that. It, I like you to see that it's kind of a whole family. My husband is a is a glass artist, and actually his uh, work he's he's famous for making work from space, which he made long before we ever met. But he's making a planet right there out of glass. And I think that it's really important for those of you out there that are our kids and people that like to tell stories. You like to share. You like to write songs. You like to write stories. You like to do art. You realize that you are a part of helping people who have a vision share the vision so they can bring the right people to their team. And so my husband is somebody like that who helps people who explore space um, to, to help other people understand where we go and why we go and why it's special. And that's what really brings a team like, you know, in this picture, we look kind of all straight and posed. And now in this picture, you see you see a space family all together. And, uh, and that's a picture of my friend uh, Tracy. That's my last slide to show. Um, I could show others if you like sometime, but um, but this one uh, is um, one of my favorites because it shows my friend Tracy, and it's like a just a person and the Earth. Hmm. Wow, that's nice. I mean, I, I'm sure it is sad to leave behind your family on Earth, but they are very very proud of you being in space. <laughs> well, because it's not everyone get to go to space. Yeah, it's true. So, it's true. Yeah. And, you know, and even though, you know, we actually, uh, Yachin, we thought about it a lot when mm -hmm. I was asked to go to the space station because, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 hard for moms to leave their families. It's hard for dads to leave their families. And yet we decided that 
um, I was trained for the mission and trained to be an astronaut and that this was part of who Jamie's mom was. And I think that this kind of sense of mission is actually valuable to lots of people right now. I know that um, Singapore has actually done such an incredible job of dealing with the coronavirus um, that it's not as much. But a part of part of what I think has happened in Singapore is that they've been so good about stay, keeping each other safe, about focusing on that mission and social distancing and so when we're away from our families in space, you know, we feel a little bit the same way. And so I know that it's it's important to still, you know, stay safe. And I think maybe it brings you a little comfort to know that astronauts have to, to do to be away from their families more than than they would like as well. Mm, yes, I'm sure. So, um, Katie, uh, we're going to answer more questions and we have uh, the next question. From uh, also from Girls to Pioneers, uh, from Salin, she's 15 years old. Now, during your time in space, what surprised you? Was there anything your training could not prepare you for? Oh, Salin, that's a very good question. Um, I I think you know, Salin, part of what. Uh, what was interesting to be up there, we practiced all the parts of being in space. You know, I would practice different experiments down. I would practice my spacewalks in a pool. I would practice even making good decisions, um, you know, about when I'm when I'm nervous, when I'm, you know, when I'm worried, when something happens and I think, oh, what am I going to do now? Well, we practice doing those things. We actually practice by being in situations that are stressful, um, but hopefully not too dangerous, but a little bit stressful. And, uh, and part of that is even taking exams where we take exams in emergency procedures and we don't just answer questions on a piece of paper. We're in a, in a simulator and we, and it looks like the space station except it's on the ground and we're all walking and we say, okay, now we have a fire in the space station. What are we going to do? And so we practice, oh, doing this and this, but we actually know there's not really a fire. And so, um, but we are actually being observed. We're being graded, just like you are in school. And that makes me feel a little bit more pressure, and that actually makes me sometimes make mistakes. And then that teaches me what are the mistakes that I am most likely to make. So when it happens up in space, then I'm ready. But the thing that I wasn't really exactly ready for was the fact that it was so amazing to be a person living in space, looking down at the earth every single day. And I felt it was so special. It was a little bit hard. I wanted to share that. I wanted to share how I felt. I wanted to take pictures for everyone every single day and realizing that I had to be very disciplined and make sure I did all my work on this on the schedule and that I couldn't actually spend all day sharing the mission with everyone. Wow. wow. <laughs> so you really do have to be prepared for everything. I love yes, that. It's true, Ferry. Okay, our next question is from Ananya. She is 11 years old. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. So, how long did you take to adjust yourself back on Earth after spending so many days in microgravity environment? That's Ananya. Ananya is, is actually a hard question. Um, when we first get back, I mean, I'll tell you just maybe from coming in for a landing. You know, here we are floating around in space. We climb into our tiny little spacecraft and then we undock from the space station. We go around the Earth a few times and then we are landing on the Earth. And so gradually as we come in for a landing, things start feeling heavier and heavier and heavier. And when then we're landing in a parachute and it's very, very sudden. And when we first land, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been on a ship or a boat, but when you get off of there, you're used to all day doing a little bit like this. And then when you're standing back on the ground, your feet still are kind of used to doing that. It kind of happens to us too, except that it's really more exaggerated. Like, whoa, when I first landed, I mean, I looked out the window in the spacecraft and I thought that the whole world was going over and around and around. And I saw that the, the grass was still. So I knew the spacecraft was not rolling, only my head. So it takes a couple of days to get used to that. And, uh, and, and then, but then after a little while, it would even just be a tiny feeling like, oh, when I bend down to tie my shoes, I feel a little bit like, 
Ooh, like this. <laughs> but it, it takes a few days and maybe a few weeks. Um, and yet there's a part of being in space that always stays with you. Wow. wow. So okay, it, so I'm just curious. Um, mm. When you're in space, when you're holding on to something and you let go of that thing, it just kind of stays uh, floating, right? And, of course, when you are back on Earth, when you do that, th- um, that object will be falling to the floor, right? Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. It is a hazard of coming home. I think that's why you asked it, Mary. Is uh, When we're in space, um, I'll say, like, so, for example, here's my, my phone. Um, it actually takes a little bit of skill to let go of the phone and not be giving it a little push one way or the other in space, right? Um, so we get to be very skilled at making things be still when we want them to be. Um, but then when we get back on Earth, I remember even just putting on my watch in the morning, um, I would be putting it on and, and suddenly it would drop to the floor. And it just would be so surprising to me. My first thought was, how did that happen? Because, you know, when we live in space, we sort of learn new rules. Our head begins to think a, a, a certain way. But it is a danger of dropping things when you get home. <laughs> okay. Yeah, to change all your uh, calories into maybe plastic <laughs> to prevent breakage. <laughs> yes. And especially, you know, I live with a glass, br- a glass blower, so we have a lot of glass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um so, um, Katie, we're going to touch a little bit on uh, some recent events, uh, okay. especially um, the private built spacecraft from this company, SpaceX, which sent two NASA astronauts to the ISS in their Demo 2 mission. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I don't know about other people, but for me, myself, I'm not such a huge uh, space geek yet. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't really understand about the excitement of this breakthrough as compared to the Americans. Now, uh, would you like to share with us why this is such an important moment for all of you back home? It's, it's really important. Um, in some ways, I, I have to tell you, it, it's, it, space flight is hard. It's difficult to have new designs. And we had the space shuttle for a long time, for many, many years, ever since 1980. And it brought us many gifts in a way because it was very large and we could bring a lot of people to space at the same time. And and that let us bring a lot of different kinds of people to space, which is completely necessary. But after a while, the space, sta- the space shuttle was older and we didn't have enough sort of room in our budget and in, in even our ideas and everything to have the space shuttle and a new vehicle. And so one thing that we have learned by having people live on a space station, and I say we, and I mean people all over the Earth have learned, is we actually know how to send people and supplies up to a space station. So once a government has learned how to do that, it's the best idea to have a commercial company take all the things the government has learned and then put that into operation like a regular business. And that's what we've done, is that we have hired in the United States some companies, and that is SpaceX for one, but also Boeing. Um, So they are each contracted to build small spacecraft that will bring people and supplies up to the space station. That doesn't mean that it's easy to do this, but it does mean that it's doable, and our commercial partners make it actually more efficient, less expensive, and what's really, but it took longer than we would like. I mean, and that's actually the reason I bring up this story is that we, we talk about going to the moon and going to Mars. We're doing those things. Those things are happening. And I say we, and I mean space agencies and companies all over the world. But it still takes time. It takes small steps of making sure that we know how to do this. And this, for example, you know, recycling air, recycling water, really important in a spacecraft, really important here on Earth. And so we're having to learn those things before we're ready to go in a spacecraft to Mars. So there's lots of things that we have to learn, and some of them we learn on in, in an experiment place called the space station. We are doing those experiments on the space station, and it was a really big deal a couple of weeks ago when we finally had more launching capability to bring people from another place on Earth, from Florida again. Now we're able to launch people and supplies. It just gives us more possibilities for launching to space. 
Wow. Wow. What an exciting time to be to be alive in, right? You know, it really yeah. is. Like that was the SpaceX capsule that went, and and they've learned so much about launching and actually about bringing parts of the rocket back to back back to Earth and and using them again. But the next is coming the Boeing company, and they have a different they have different ideas of how they've implemented their system. We're learning from all of those, and they can actually take bigger chances than governments, not with people. But when they're figuring out, what if the spacecraft was like this? What if it was like this? The companies can take bigger chances to understand all those things, and by and it helps them sort of leapfrog ahead, and it brings all of us with them. So it's very exciting. We're going to see a lot of interesting launches in the next few years, and we're going to the moon. Wow. Okay. So the next question is related to our current topic, and it's from our Instagram follower. In your opinion, how viable will space tourism be in the future? And do you think we will have to go through extensive training just to go to space? I think that we will have people, more people going to space. We already are. We just talked about the SpaceX launch that happened last week. In August, they will send three astronauts to space to live on the space station for a long time. But SpaceX is a, is a company, and so is Boeing, and they are allowed to, within the contract, bring other people to space. And so that's one way. The Russians have been bringing people to space on their Soyuz capsule um, and, and, and allowing them to live on the space station for a long time now. And then there's other companies like um, Blue Origin is, is not bringing people yet, but they will be experiments up there, uh, Virgin Galactic. And every, what I think is important to realize is it's not like everyone in the whole world is going to go right now, but more and more people are going to go all the time. And when they go up to space and they see the view that I have seen and other astronauts have seen, and then they come home, they have a new perspective of how connected everyone here on Earth is. And they and they can communicate that to people and help join people together to really solve problems together as the crew of the Earth, the crew of Spaceship Earth. Wow. Mm. Well, I guess I'm going to add that to my bucket list then, going to space. <laughs> oh, it should definitely be on your bucket list. Yep. And I think it, I think that you and Yashin would have a pretty great time up there, and you would bring you know your people who share every Friday night at least, right? You're sharing with people, sharing science with people, and um, or the Singapore Science Museum is doing that. And when we bring some of our people who can share science to space, what happens when they come home? Well, they're sharing a lot of really cool stuff. Mm. That's right, and and you know, Katie. Speaking of sharing about really cool stuff, we have uh, our viewer who is asking uh, this question. Okay, so this question from Chris: um, As a chemist, what chemistry experiments did you do in space? So, as a chemist, I did a lot of. Uh, I we, I did probably hundreds of experiments in in space and they're actually in many fields besides my field and you know you might think oh well how come she's not doing her experiments but the space station is a laboratory and it's important to do the best ideas everywhere um, I did on my on my first uh, mission um, we got to do some experiments with polymers I'm a polymer chemist and I, I think that by being someone who knows how to do experiments, that has hands that, you know, I've done experiments myself, I know what kinds of questions to be asking maybe when things go wrong or when we run out of time. You know, is it more important to the scientists to do lots of different little experiments or more important to do a few experiments very perfectly? And so I, I am somebody that can ask them those questions so that everybody on the crew understands better how to do the experiments when we're not, when we don't have the ability to talk to them. Um, but we do a lot of different experiments and that's why I think it's important for everyone to have some science education and some math education and some writing education because all of us in our lives need to be able to understand what we read in the newspaper about science, about our environment, about our government, about choices that we make. And so in a way, my life as an astronaut, as a chemist, isn't all that different than just a regular citizen. Wow. Do you remember, Yajing, when we did 
when we took polymer yeah. chemistry in uni and like do you remember how difficult <laughs> the experiment was? Imagine doing that in space, like Katie. Wait, well, yeah, experiments are they are hard and that's why um you know we have to do a lot of them. You know how many experiments we have to do down here on Earth to get a result that we believe? Well, our our space station is an experiment place, it's a laboratory. And 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 we're doing some really fascinating things up there. I do like the ones with liquids really quite a bit because you know they tell us things like when I showed the the slides of water drops and things like that, it tells us something about every process that involves flow through a pipe. And that means like every factory, that means every river, that means cleaning up pollution, that means medical testing when we put a drop of fluid on a slide and it climbs up. We're learning about the tiny tiny forces that are affected there. And so it's really, I think, pretty wonderful to have the opportunity to do experiments in a place where we can't do those experiments down here on Earth. So I was very proud to do those experiments. Yep. Nice. Okay, so the next question um, from our live audience, uh, a question from Jonathan. What happens when someone gets sick in the ISS? Uh, what, what kind? Well, I'll, I'll tell you both kinds of sick. How about this? <laughs> Um, is sometimes when we first get up to space, I can't speak for anyone else, but on one of my missions, I did not feel well. And that actually happens to a lot of astronauts. And it's um, for the kids out there where, you know, and all of us really, when you don't feel well, you just think, oh, do I not feel well? Oh, I kind of don't. But, you know, then, you know, we have special bags for doing that, for throwing up. And they have kind of handkerchiefs on the outside. And we just, you know, we do what we need to do. And our friends kind of help us just like here on Earth. And then we go back to work because we feel better. And also we have medicine for that kind of thing. But if, uh, if for in terms of disease, that doesn't happen very much. You saw when um, Chris Cassidy just went up to space and the other crew in, the, in his Russian crewmates, um, they undergo a quarantine just like here on Earth during COVID-19. And we use the same principles of washing our hands and be staying close and, and not getting close to people um, when if we don't feel well. Those are principles that have lasted for a really long time and they work. You know, that we, we can keep each other safe in that way. Astronauts have been doing quarantine for missions for as long as astronauts have been going to space. So we pretty much don't get sick, but we do bring a lot of medicine up there. And we and we have telehealth. Really, we have our doctors on the ground. Ah, OK. So you have to report your health to the doctors just to make yeah. sure that you're OK. And, and, you know, and even, um, you know, just, uh, you know, we can we can show them on the camera. Hey, you know, I have like, you know, it kind of hurts like a little bit right here. You know, it's not really back here in my throat, but right back here. And then they can understand better what uh, what kinds of things might be helpful to us. But pretty much we don't really get very sick up on the space station. Mm, that's good. But we're, but we're ready. You know, we're, we're prepared for that. And so mm. we're, we're definitely bringing a lot of medicines and it's pretty fascinating to do the training. You know, we learned and we have an AED for if, if we have problems with our hearts, we have an, an AED for uh, and we and we train and we practice and we practice coordinating that care that we do with the doctors on the earth. Mm. Wow. So, um, Katie, the next question uh, from our audience, uh, they are pretty similar. So I'm going to ask these two questions together. So one is from Angela. And one is from the Lam family. So Angela is asking if there is a height minimum, uh, a height limit to be an astronaut. And also the Lam family is asking if there is any age limit. So age limit and height limit, maybe also weight limit to be an <laughs> astronaut. <laughs> uh, we don't have. Well, we do have height limits, and I want to say that is, uh, I'm, I only know them um, in, uh, in English me measurements about five foot two. I'm, um, I'm five foot four, um, so I, I, but it might be five foot four now. It's something, it's something, you know, close to my height. It's, you, you can't, and, the, and what they base it on is being able to sit in the seats and make sure that you can see and also in the spacesuits. And then um, in the, they basically have to make sure you fit in the vehicles. And the Soyuz, for example, is very small. And some people who are very, very tall, I think it's, uh, I think you could be six foot four um, in the space shuttle, but in the Soyuz only six foot two. But it really depends, you know, do you have a long waist or long legs? So we're always looking at all the measurements. And age limit. 
Uh, I know that John Glenn was 77 years old in the U.S. space program when he went back to space. So I think I have a long time to go. Even though I'm retired, maybe I could go back. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, wow. So, so there's no age limit to it. No, you know, let me answer a question maybe they were asking, Yachin, which is, you know, it takes a little while to be qualified to be an astronaut. And yet the qualifications, in, I'm going to give you the United States qualifications. It's a uh, university plus uh, a master's degree um, and plus okay. two years experience in a technical field. Or uh -huh. a university plus a PhD and no experience. And there's actually quite a number of people in all of our countries that meet those requirements. And so realize that if you are going to university in a technical field, you are already on your way. And you should consider yourself a candidate. That's pretty exciting, I think. Yeah, very. <laughs> pretty exciting. Yes, I think, I think maybe Barry is thinking, oh, hmm. when is my turn? <laughs> well, in both of you, you know? But I'm not sure if I make the height limit, though. <laughs> I'm quite sure. <laughs> well, you know, it, but here, Yuchin, that's a really important point, is that I was quoting, you know, the height limit for when I was there, and it's changed, I think, just recently. But it's based on buildings, on fitting in the spacecraft. But now we just talked about the commercial companies are building more spacecraft. Well, people, I mean, it's, and we know more about like with 3D printing and everything else, we know more about designing equipment that fits everyone. And it's so important. I mean, I have to say that a lot of the equipment in the space program was actually for me very big. And I had to learn how to adapt that and how to make it work for me. But now that we have advanced manufacturing and we realize that we really want to have so many different kinds of people come to space, well, you know, I wouldn't look at the limits, the height limits right now or the age limits and think that they're going to apply to you because those are the kinds of things that can change. Okay. Wow. Right. <laughs> okay. So the next question has been asked by so many people, and we just have to ask that um, to you. So can you see other planets from space with the naked, with your naked eye? We can see them from space with the naked eye. I have to tell you, they look, you know, pretty much like they look to you. I mean, if you, if my fist is the Earth here, you know, we're, we're about, you know, a couple hundred kilometers above the Earth, right? But it's still a long ways from any stars and planets. And so if we really want to see them closely, we need a telescope as well. And that's what's kind of exciting is we have instruments on the space station outside on the porch, so to speak, that are taking images of planets and stars and helping us learn about the universe. Mm. Wow. That's uh, because a lot of uh, audience have been asking if they, you can see other planets. So we thought, mm, OK, mm -hmm. so we hope you answer your questions. Uh, in fact, the next uh, segment that we have for our viewers today, okay, is the, what we call the quick fire round. So okay. maybe we have prepared some questions, and uh, these questions are, are either asked either by our IG followers or our live audience. So uh, Ferry is going to ask the questions, okay? So are we okay. ready? All right, I, Ferry, fire I think away. I'm ready. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so first question: How did you feel when you landed back on Earth? A tiny bit sad, but so happy to see my family. Okay. What is your favorite space theme movie? Ooh. I love gravity because when I was up in space, I got to help with it. And even though some of the physics is not correct, I think it gives you the feeling of being in space. Wow. And I, and I heard you um, did something with uh, the actress, right? Like you helped her, you coach her or something, right? I did. I did. We had her phone number and we would call her from the space station and she asked our advice. Okay. Oh, so you were in the space station back then when you coached yes. her? Yes. Yes. So it's very uh -oh. exciting for us. Okay. Mm. Next question. Uh, favorite space food? Oh, 
I like something called fiesta chicken. It's chicken in some sauce, and then we would put it on tortillas, which is a really good kind of bread to bring because it doesn't bring, take up a lot of space. And I would take it out of the package, and I would squeeze it onto my tortilla, and then I can actually just roll it up and eat it, or I can sort of pass it to my friend, to then to my crewmate, who has to catch it very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next question. How does it feel when accelerating during launch? Oh, it it feels it feels like you're not going so fast, but you're just you're just going. You just feel like there is this amazing giant force in back of you, and you are never going to stop until you get there. Wow. Next question from our Instagram follower. Your first reaction when you entered space for the first time. I I just I I <coughs> excuse me fairy I I felt like I was home I'd waited my whole life to be there and I realized that uh, it's a place that belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is also from our IG follower. Favorite view from space and how did you how did it make you feel? My favorite view was uh, was of home. For me, that's Massachusetts. And the big thing that you should know is that on the space station or any vehicle, any capsule that we've had, we always had little tiny windows. And if you're trying to see Earth and you're sort of looking through and islands like Hawaii go by very quickly, you know, and, and you don't see them. But up on the space station, we have that set of windows that I showed where you can look and you can see, you know, from my from Massachusetts has a piece that sticks out. So I always know it's I see it and I see it coming and then it's here and then I turn around and I see it going. And so I really love the view of home. And even when I pass over, I feel like I'm home. And that's where my family is. Wow, amazing. Okay, favorite part of the day on board of the ISS? Favorite part of the day? For me, I'm almost always the last one to go to bed. And everyone is sleeping. And I'm turning the lights out. And then I always take a last tour just to check on things. But it's just me in a, in a space station that's kind of dark. So there's a few, there's night lights on, but it, and I just feel like I'm just cruising in my own space world. I loved it. Wow. Okay, favorite part of the ISS? The cupola. That's the, win the place with all the windows where we look at the Earth and we take pictures and we feel home. I would I would guess that as well. Okay, favorite <laughs> space mission that you are a part of? Absolutely, my mission to the space station. Living up there almost six months. I remember on my first mission, longest mission at the time, 16 days on the space shuttle. And when we were landing, I thought, why are we landing? We have so much really important work to do up in space. And even on my six month mission, I would have spent another six months in a minute. Okay. Wow. Then um, that's actually the next question here. Given given a chance, would you like to go back to the ISS? I would go in any spaceship, anytime, anywhere. Space it's 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 magical. It's the frontier and it's people that make it that frontier and I liked being a part of that. Wow. Okay. The last um, question from the quick fire questions. Uh, this is also from Instagram follower. Given the chance, would you want to be the first few people living on Mars? Yes. <laughs> now, having said that, having said that, Perry, I don't think I will be. And uh, and I think you know when we talk about going to Mars, one of the reasons we haven't been yet is we're not really quite ready. We have a lot of things to still work out, and some of those some of those things we can figure out on our laboratory, the space station. Some of those things we can figure out on the moon, and some of those things we will be figuring out on the way to Mars and when we get to Mars. But we're not quite ready for that, and so it could very well be someone who's listening right now who is one of those few people living on Mars and bringing all of us with them to Mars. I hope she's out there. <laughs> yes. We hope um, that person is out there as well, because there's a lot of groundwork to do before we go over to Mars. Yep. And and right. you, you may not be the you may not be one of the people that that actually went to Mars, but you could be one of the engineers that built the spacecraft or the Mars base. And I guess that's exciting to be too to be a part of it, right? 
it's yeah. not only exciting, but it's 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 so important, Vera. You know, when I go to space, I mean, I, I happen to be the person who's lucky enough to be on the top of the rocket and then living in the space station. But the work of so many people made that possible. So many people saying, hey, I, I have an idea and I, I think it could be important. And, and it takes some bravery to speak up about those ideas, but realize that every single one of us has some ideas that other people don't have. And so... Look inside, deep inside, find that bravery and voice those ideas because they're important. Mm. Wow. Yes, in, yeah. In fact, um, we, we do have one more thing <laughs> um, uh, to ask you, okay? So, uh, Dr. Katie, what would you like to say to aspiring astronauts? I say to all of you, I mean, some of you may want to be coming to space and but I, but not just aspiring astronauts, but I'm, I'm really talking to all of the kids that are out there. Realize that what you're doing right now, you are already practicing to be astronauts or practicing to be the person that you will become. Because I guarantee that you are reading, you are writing, you are using mathematics, you are learning science, and all, and, and you are do, and you are learning to tell stories and to share your ideas, to share your, your, your work. Because if you could have the best invention in the whole world, and if you can't explain it to somebody or share it, then no one's going to know. And so all of you in school, and you're working in groups. I talked to you a little bit about what it's like to be, you know, an astronaut and, and actually, you know, see uh, what it's like to be up there. That could be you because you are learning to work in groups in school. So right now you're getting ready. You're taking those steps. Just keep going forward one step after another. And I'm very excited to figure, to, to look, to find out what you are going to be. Wow. So, Wow, I mean, that was really, really inspiring. I mean, I wish, I wish I could really, really live that dream one day and like, I, I could be an astronaut myself. I don't know. Here's hoping. So thank you so much, Katie, for being here with us and sharing all these, um, things, uh, that you, that you went through. Um, watching here, um, whose questions about living in space that we not managed to answer. Unfortunately, we have limited time here, but you know, you, you might want to check out our previous podcast episode about living in space. Your questions might be answered there. Yep. Well, so, you, you yeah, have, there were some great questions, and, and I really liked the way you asked them, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, um, well, uh, unfortunately, our time with uh, Dr. Katie Coleman is so short, <laughs> but we really, really enjoy ourselves today. Thank you, Dr. Katie. Now, um, this interview with Dr. Katie Coleman was brought to you by U.S. Embassy Singapore. So we want to thank U.S. Embassy Singapore for making this happen for us. And also to Girls to Pioneers for sharing this broadcast and for inspiring young women. That's very important, right? <laughs> All right. So um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed yourself. And do stay tuned to our next podcast. Until then, stay home. Stay safe. And keep looking up. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Katie. Bye-bye.